we have come here today to remember before God our brother David, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to God, our merciful Redeemer and Judge, and to comfort one another in our grief. Let us pray. Eternal God, your mercy is without end, and your steadfast love never ceases. Accept our prayers for David and receive him into the land of light and joy, into the company of your saints, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember David before you and thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your compassion, console those who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call, we are gathered into the company of all your saints. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. some modicum of his wit, of his intelligence, of his lived experience, of his conviction, and of his depth, that I might be up to this challenge. It's a challenge that comes with summarizing the life and the influence of a man who even at 95 years of age could recall in uncanny and vivid detail every boy who passed through the halls of Cathedral School for Boys while David was headmaster. The boys' background, the complexity of the boys' parents, the boys' accomplishments, and even his indiscretions. <laughs> it's the challenge of describing a geology major who later went on to study theology challenge of describing a man who could love equally the energy of urban cities and the peace of national parks. And for me, it's the challenge of describing a man who was as much mythological as he was mortal. You see, I knew of David Forbes before I ever met David Forbes. Long before I became involved with Cathedral School for Boys, David's influence, exerted through a variety of different forms, had made its way across the country and seeped into the institutions and the communities in which I was living and working. There was the creator, David, the man known for building great schools, Cathedral School for Boys right next door, and St. Paul's School in Oakland across the bay. 
This David recognized the need to create excellent independent schools that were accessible to any student, regardless of his or her background, regardless of his or her circumstances. To this end, our David followed in the footsteps of Saint David, the sixth century Welsh bishop, founder of monasteries and churches. Both Davids, the saint and the canon, recognized the power of the collective over the individual and sought to develop institutions that would contribute to society. There was also David the Epistolary, the man who appeared through correspondence written to the founders of many schools, and in particular Canterbury School, the school in North Carolina that I led before moving to San Francisco. Appreciating David's reputation as a creator of schools, this group had sought David's advice about the creation of their own school. Through a carefully and powerfully crafted series of letters, David extolled the virtues of Episcopal schools and the essential role of religious formation in them. Famously, David recognized that spirituality in Episcopal schools was better caught than taught. And rather than serving merely as vehicles for professional success, David understood Episcopal schools as tools for building a better world. There was also David the theologian, the man who appeared through articles and position papers published by a variety of organizations, and especially the National Association of Episcopal Schools. This David implored school leaders to recognize the, in the, the educational influence of diversity at a time when diversity in independent schools had yet to be fully realized. These were the forms of the Reverend Canon David Forbes that appeared to me again before I ever met the man. Thus, he was at this point, at least for me, more myth than man, and I had begun to form in my imagination the impression of a person who loomed as large in body as he was in influence, a hulking colossus whose physical prowess both symbolized and embodied his hefty reputation. How interesting it was then to meet David for the first time. This meeting took place just a few months before I moved to San Francisco. We had arranged to have dinner during the biennial conference held by the National Association of Episcopal Schools. And I remember scouring the auditorium, which was our meeting place, seeking out someone of Dwight Clark's stature, yet wearing vestments befitting the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> How surprising it was then to finally encounter David the man, small in stature, and because he was well into his 80s at the time, frail. He was much more David than Goliath, and yet his influence was obvious. Of the hundreds of people in the room, he was the only one surrounded by others, a host of educators all eager to be in the presence of this great man. It is worth recognizing that the bodies in our universe that exert the strongest gravitational pull are also some of the universe's most diminutive. And here he was, a veritable neutron star of a man, surrounded by other bodies inescapably drawn to and revolving around him. It was late in the afternoon, yet David waited patiently and gave each one of them his full and undivided attention. The throng eventually subsided, and I made my way over to him. Without even introducing myself, he grabbed my elbow for support. I acknowledged that it was late in the afternoon and that we could easily find more time later, but David, as David did, proceeded to regale me for the next few hours with stories of the founding of and the philosophy behind his beloved Cathedral School for Boys. His energy only grew as the conversation continued, and I couldn't get enough of it. 
Speaking with so many of you over these last few weeks since David's death, I've been reminded of just how much we were all drawn to him. This theme of David surrounding by others emerged regularly through correspondence and through conversation. How many of us traveled to Palm Springs or wanted to travel to Palm Springs in David's last few weeks? Your memories of him, your attraction to him, correspond to my own memories and attraction. And although I had never had the occasion to observe him in his prime as the headmaster of Cathedral School for Boys, we can imagine how he operated in the hallways, as a body always in motion, always surrounded by others. If we revert back just for a minute to the imaginative power of our kindergarten selves, we can see him at this very moment. Here he is depicted at a mural at the front of Grace Cathedral, appearing at that perfect time to lay a firm but loving hand on a boy's shoulder. Here he is channeling somehow the incomparable and kinetic force that was Mimi Lowry to start one of this country's great schools. Here he is chaperoning eighth grade trips to Yosemite weather be damned, so that boys could get outside of the city and experience something transcendent and perhaps discover even the presence of God in nature. Here he is responding to yet another one of the Orser boys called into his office for yet another disciplinary infraction. This Orser proudly proclaims, <laughs> Canon Headmaster, I'm not scared of you. And David retorts by saying, well, you should be because you are now suspended. <laughs> Here he is attending choir camp, both to satiate his own love for choral music and to delight the choristers with ghost stories told around the campfire. Here he is attending, just until a few months ago, every cathedral school board meeting as an emeritus trustee. Here he is being asked about whether he ever wished that he had had boys instead of girls, the Forbes girls, as they were affectionately and are affectionately known at our school. And David responds by saying, why do I need boys? I have 165 sons right now. Perhaps the true challenge of remembering David comes in trying to depict the multitude of ways in which he offered himself to us, to each of us, father, husband, partner, teacher, leader, educator, theologian, friend, activist, confidant. It's the challenge of describing a man who in one moment carries the complexity of a Picasso mural and in the next the simple beauty of a Vermeer portrait. A dear friend once described a fellow educator in this way. He was a sonata fading into a jazz rift rising into show tunes that dropped into a bluegrass ballad that sails into an operatic aria and becomes beach music without you even noticing. How aptly this describes David too. Most style manuals warn against the use of tautologies and mixed metaphors. They can often confuse and unnecessarily complicate the spoken and written word. Perhaps this eulogy represents, a, offers a good representation of the dangers there. And yet I can't help but remember much less describe David without employing triple tautologies and a myriad of metaphors. And it is in this, I believe, that David's power truly lay. It's not that David was unduly or unnecessarily complicated but rather that he had the divine gift of empathy. He had an innate and God-given ability to understand the needs of others. If he could tell what those of us in his presence needed at that particular moment, and he could deliver that in miraculous ways. For you see, above everything else, David was a shepherd, and we were his flock. As we make our way through today's liturgy, we should remain mindful of the frequency with which images 
and addiction, addiction of the pastoral. Shepherds, lambs, sheep, flocks appear. Certainly these are images that in Christian theology symbolize God and our relationship to him. But for those of us who knew David Forbes, we can't help but recognize that these themes and these images represent so thoroughly his place in our lives. For in the words of the great hymn number 664, known by all cathedral school boys, our shepherd did supply our need, and David was his name. reading from the book of Job. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me, never satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side and my eyes shall behold, and not another. 
the word of the Lord. A reading from the Revelation to John. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of water, of, uh, springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if and I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Amen. Amen. My strongest recollection of that September afternoon includes the smell of, the clean smell of heat smell that's unique to Northern California that's a mixture of chaparral and dust with a little bit of campfire mixed in. <coughs> As a newly ordained 27-year-old in my first Bishop's, uh, Bishop's Ranch clergy retreat, David Forbes in cut-off jeans was the first person to greet me. Yeah, those cut-off jeans make us laugh, don't they? He already knew my name before I'd even met him. And he knew that I'd graduated from the University of California, and he was the one who welcomed me into my adult life, into my life's profession. Now, um, Bruce O'Neill in those days, he and I we used to be completely, um, uh, we'd be confused for each other. So uh, um, the old priest would call me Bruce all the time. And, uh, but the one person who always knew my name was David. David always loved beginnings, and it's part of what made him such a compelling character. His enthusiasm for the future always made him seem young. David was part of the very beginning of this cathedral. When he arrived, when he was 27, as a deacon, there was only one priest on staff here, and the cathedral ended at that third column. And after the third column, there's just a sheet of sheet metal all the way to the hundred foot high, all the way closing off half the cathedral. And there was one bell tower, but not the other bell tower. Even more important, in those days, the cathedral was unknown to the people in the city. And he used to love telling the story that illustrated that. He talked about a cab driver who was driving him and said, that's a Presbyterian church and they'll never finish it. David had a hand in bringing to being pretty much everything you see around you right now, even to the candlestick holders. But he's the one who helped to move the, the altar into the center of the, of the transept. David was the one who designed the, the vestments that we wear. Um, Bishop Mark is, is frequently reminding us that David's influence on the liturgy, the worship of this church, uh, influenced churches around the world. And if you look, you can look carefully at this lectern before you go. The inscription on it, David chose the inscription on it. It is in the beginning, written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. 
Now, as you heard Burns describe, David was the driving force behind starting Cathedral School for Boys, St. Paul's Oakland, and even the National Association of Episcopal Schools. And he accomplished far more than we can outline today. The New York Times columnist David Brooks talks about resume virtues and eulogy virtues. David Forbes had more than enough of both. But I'm going to especially miss the encyclopedic quality of his knowledge about things that really matter to me. On David's last visit to San Francisco, he took me around San Francisco on a wild drive around the city. He was the one who was driving at age 96. <laughs> and everything we did, we just did in slow motion so everybody would make way for us. I mean, if we were going to do a, a, a U-turn on California Street between Jones and Taylor, you know, people um, made space for us because we were going so slowly. He showed me all the houses he'd ever lived in. He took me down to the Lake Street. He showed me this, we stopped at this one point and he was, it was this ancient looking apartment building. And he said, I remember when I was a kid and they were building that and told me the details of how it came into being. And then he pulled over and he looked me in the eye and he said, Malcolm, I want you to preach at my funeral service. Now, the purpose of that long drive and the lunch that followed was for him, for him to help me with what I'm going to say today. David left us with a kind of puzzle, a mystery that we are all going to solve together. David chose everything in this service. The readings, the hymns, the ritual of the meal that we will soon share. These all include a message addressed individually to each of us. And they articulate the answer to a very simple question. Who will God be for you? What difference will God make in your life and through your actions in the world? Now, I'm only going to make three very short points. The first is that we live in a world that is alienated and alienating. We often feel cut off from God. We do not experience things as they actually are. Instead, the world's social construction of reality often makes it difficult for us to perceive the light of God, the light which has shined since the very first day of creation. As it says in the prologue to John, in the beginning was the Word. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not overcome it. David, if you knew him at all well, understood darkness. He was acquainted with darkness, and he, he was profoundly concerned about it. Hatred, conflict, racism, mental illness, sexism, prejudice against gay people, poverty, the desecration of the earth, and so much more. All these issues deeply troubled him. He would be in despair today over the school shootings in Texas. My second point has to do with the image that David gave us for the Good Shepherd. I have to tell you, we read the wrong uh, gospel this, this afternoon. The, the right gospel is written in your bulletin. It's about the Good Shepherd. That's what he wanted us to, to be thinking about. The Good Shepherd is a reminder to us that we always have a choice. We can always decide who will be our master. Now, I know many successful beautiful, wealthy, brilliant people who are at the same time deeply miserable. They are unhappy because their lives are held in the grip of a relentless and heartless master. They are slaves to the whim of their ego. So in short, we have to choose between our own ego and the good shepherd. So what is a good shepherd? Now, in high school, I learned quite a lot about sheep because it was Davis, and there's lots of sheep there, and there's 4-H there's there, and there's an agricultural college. Sheep were pretty much all over the place as I was growing up. And so when the, when the, when the um, psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I know what that means. And I'll tell you, sheep will only lie down if four conditions are met. The first is the sheep needs to be free from fear, 
free of parasites, free of hunger, and at peace with the other sheep around it. And the good shepherd, the shepherd who loves them, is the one who makes this freedom possible. For me, having Jesus as my good shepherd makes me more free from fear, more at peace with the people in my life. My last point is that this image of the good shepherd in the, in the gospel that we read earlier today too, they both come from Jesus' last meal with his friends. And at that meal, Jesus tells his friends that he gives them a new commandment, that they love one another. The New Testament scholar Herman Weichen emphasizes that this love, which he calls agape, which is the Greek word for it, is not just a personal emotion. Instead, this love is the service that liberates. That's what he calls it, the service that liberates. The response to this love should not be a mystical devotion to Jesus, but just practically, us to love one another. Now, for this reason, David devoted his life to the liberation of all people. And in, the and in his 90s, he was serving on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force at a crucial time for the Cathedral School for Boys. And his commitment to those meetings, his creativity, the work that he did was absolutely crucial to the life of the school today. And his comments in the trustee meetings, they were constantly about lifting up students from disadvantaged backgrounds. What will God be for you? And what difference will that make? The congregation here at Grace Cathedral is used to me giving homework in my sermons, and I've never given a humor, a homework in a funeral sermon in my entire life. I've never crossed that line. But I have something for you to offer. I have homework for each of you. As you leave this place, take the bulletin home with you and spend some time looking at the last hymn that we are going to be singing together. The hymn goes like this. All my hope on God is founded. He doth still my trust renew. Me through change and chance he guideth. Only good and only true. God unknown, you alone, call my heart to be thine own. I will always love David. He was such a good listener. He was constantly looking after other people. He made us feel valued, like we mattered, even when we're just the youngest guy at the at the clergy conference. David was humble, and he lived in a state of constant gratitude, and he had a kind of inner life, and I miss him. I think about him nearly every day. I've been, I've been having a tough time lately, and I know I could use his help. No one knows what happens after you die. But for the past few months, as David has been making his farewells to his friends, he's been saying over and over, he said it a couple times to me, see you on the other side. David has been faithful. He has been a good shepherd to us. And I don't know what heaven is, but I imagine it to be like, like the countryside uphill from the Russian River as it winds through Healdsburg. And I can imagine that as we travel through the vineyards, as, as we approach the ranch house there, ready for our new beginning, I can imagine David welcoming us and greeting each of us by name.
in the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. For our brother David, let us pray to our Savior Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Jesus, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Be with us and all who mourn for David and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, O Christ. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, O Christ. You raise the dead to life. Give our brother eternal life. Hear us, O Christ. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, O Christ. Our brother was washed in the waters of that baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him a place in the company of your saints. Hear us, O Christ. He was nourished with your body and blood in the Eucharist. Grant him a place at the table at the banquet you have promised to your people at the close of the age. Hear us, o Christ. Comfort us in our sorrow at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Eternal God, whose days are without end and whose mercies cannot be numbered, help us to be conscious of the brevity and uncertainty of all human life. May your Holy Spirit lead us all our days so that when we shall have served you in our time, we may be gathered to our ancestors with a good conscience in the communion of the Catholic Church and the confidence of a sure faith in the comfort of a holy hope, in favor with you, our God, and at peace with the world. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Very briefly, welcome to Grace Cathedral. This is a spiritual home for many of you, a place of great familiarity. Uh, people who have been in the circle of David Forbes, uh, this is a cent was a center of his life and the ongoing life of him and his family and many of you. We are very glad you're here. If this is not a place with which you are familiar, uh, let me welcome you in the name of this great congregation, of their dean, of the clergy, the lay volunteers and employees. They are always working to make this a place of genuine welcome that respects all and welcomes all into this service and life together. We are very, very glad you're here. Uh, thank you, Dean Malcolm, for those wonderful words and also uh, Head Burns Jones for your wonderful eulogy. I know that inspired all of us. 
There is a reception that is on the plaza, which is uh, to my left after the service. Uh, and I believe there's uh, food in the chapter house uh, dining room. But I, you know, we all we want, want to be out in the great light of uh, Northern California and in the safety of some breeze and some wind together. So uh, let's gather out there, share memories, share love, and be together at this time. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. For to your faithful people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal body lies in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your compassion, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling Christ's radiant life, death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant David. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold. 
a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God, the source of all being, the incarnate word, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God.